We welcome you back to the Halftime Report, and we welcome in our special guest today. Jeffrey Gunlock is the CEO and co-founder of Double Line. He joins us today by phone. Jeffrey, welcome back. I hope you're well. I hope you're healthy and safe. Yeah, we're, health, we're healthy and safe and uh, tired of sheltering in place, but everything's going fine. It's uh, been a while since we got together. I think the last interview we did was by phone as well. We were talking about how uh, people were talking about how the market was getting a little bit sloppy. And I was pointing out that in the fixed income market, things were remarkably orderly. And that generally these moves that when they start getting momentum on the downside, they don't end with the markets being very orderly. And boy, did we get disorder in the middle of March. We, we, we sure did. But, you know, we've moved a far, a far place from that now, you know, from an equity side and, and really credit is acting better. From, from the, the fact that we've rallied so far back for, from an equity uh, standpoint, I mean, what is your general view of the markets right now relative to what you were talking about that you were just referencing, this disorder that we had in large swaths of the market to where we are today? Yeah, uh, the markets pretty much recovered, obviously, because of the Fed on April 9th in particular, taking the bold step of pretty blatantly violating the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. I mean, the Federal Reserve cannot buy corporate bonds. Now, I know that they're not technically buying corporate bonds, but they're doing it clearly by sleight of hand and in a semantic sense not doing it, but they're certainly doing it. But since April 9th, what's interesting is – the LQD ETF, which is investment-grade corporate bonds, have been meandering lower. That was actually their high day, was when the Fed came out uh, with their initiative to buy even corporate bonds. And uh, JNK is one of the high-yield ETFs, same thing. It's, it's not falling a lot, but uh, you're right. These things are up way off their lows. LQD uh, looks to be about the most overvalued asset uh, in, the, in the bond market to me because the prices got all the way back to within 3% of their highs thanks to the Fed move, after, after a huge decline. Now, the Fed action has certainly shored that up. J&K has retraced, similar to the stock market, about half of its decline. But all of these markets are looking quite tired these days, and the sentiment shifts should have investors concerned. I mean, I was watching a, a segment on CNBC earlier this morning, and it's talking about how people are looking for aggressive opportunities. You know, the time for aggressive opportunities was March 23rd. Uh, not April 27th. So I, I think that the markets uh, really are celebrating um, the idea that, you know, the cases are slowing down and they're talking about opening up maybe even New York City and all that stuff. But I, I would caution investors to be wary of panaceas like this where, you know, test, 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 you know, that's going to be the answer to all of our problems and uh, open the economy. There's the two kind of catchphrases that you hear a lot of. And certainly those things are better than not having those things. But I, I think many people don't understand the wide-ranging ramifications of the societal shift that's going on. One of the things that I like talking about, for example, is the, uh, the, the CARES Act with its uh, pay, uh, PPP sort of aspect of payroll uh, check protection. It actually gives people, uh, m many people, a lot more money for not working than what they had when they were at their job before they lost their job or got furloughed. I mean, a lot of people are making 25% more. I, I have family members who have pointed this out to me who said, this is, this is amazing. I've lost my job, but I'm making more money by not working, uh, thanks to the $600 per week bonus in, in the unemployment benefit. And that just, makes, that just makes the cost structure of reopening these businesses really prohibitive. I mean, businesses where a lot of small businesses barely make it week to week prior to the COVID-19 and if you increase their uh, cost structure in terms of getting employees back by 25 percent, it's almost impossible for them to open. We keep talking about restaurants reopening and talking about uh, removing half of the tables in the restaurant is one idea. Well, most restaurants make five, and if they're super lucky, a 10 percent profit margin. You take off, take 10 percent of the 50 percent of their tables away. Sure, their cost structure might be reduced because they don't need as many wait staff and so on, but there's no way they can make any money. So I, I just think if other things, uh, state and local problems are certainly going to accelerate and become uh, a greater part of people's awareness. So I'm certainly in the camp that we are not out of the woods Did and that, um, you know, the stock market's had a big recovery, mm -hmm. uh, which isn't all that surprising given that everybody and their brother said, uh, oh, we're going to get a retest of the low. We're going to retest that March 23rd low. And, of course, the opposite happened. We ended up roaring back.
Do you, do you think, think is that now way. off the table? Is it off the table now, retesting the low because of the Fed? No, it's not at all. In fact, I think I think we take out the low. I, I, I think a retest of the low was very plausible. A lot of us have been around a lot of years, almost fell victim to our uh, historical experience and expecting that relatively uh, soon retest of the Dow Jones below 19,000 industrial average. But I, I just don't think that's going to happen. We're, I, I, think, I think that people don't understand the magnitude of uh, social, uh, I, I'm not going to say unrest, but social you know, unease, at least, that's going to happen when you have what's now 26 million plus people have lost their job. That's, we've lost every single job that we created since the bottom in 2009. Every single job is gone. Now, they're not the same jobs. I'm just talking about the count, the number sure. of employment count. I mean, that's just incredible. So we have zero interest rates. We have quantitative easing, which is vastly greater in one month than all of the quantitative easing in the history of the United States until a month ago. Right. And so in a certain sense, we ha- we're really kind of never left the global financial crisis, if you think about it. Our unemployment rate is now worse. We've lost all the jobs. The policies that we put in place, zero interest rates, and massive quantitative easing, well, we're, we're back at them again. I think investors and citizens have to ask themselves, you know, we thought that the weird policies of 2008-2009 were supposed to fix things, but now we're doing them on steroids. And so are we ever going to leave these policies? If it took us 12 years to get back to these policies, what, what's it going to take next time to get back to them? Five years? I mean, these things probably have a half-life. So I know, I know that the virus is obviously the massive catalyst for all this stuff. But I think what people don't understand is the, the debt-based economic scheme of the United States I've been talking about for a long time mm-hmm. has really been revealed. I mean, we've, I've seen numerous people come on CNBC over the course of the last year and point out that a large fraction of Americans don't have any rainy day fund, that they can't absorb an unexpected expense of a few hundred dollars. Well, that, we now have seen that happen, and I've got to believe that this has traumatized an awful lot of people. And maybe we'll actually get back to a strange, quaint notion called saving. And, it's, in fact, like buying things after you save the money for them, like we used to do uh, you know, 40 years ago before we went into this debt-based economic scheme. And furthermore, I think the problem with these bailouts that are unfortunately very top-heavy again, because that's really the only practical way to administer these things. I mean, when the, when the economy absolutely collapses like it did a month ago, it's very, very difficult to scramble and try to uh, supply you know, rescue relief, except through really the channels that are already open, which tend to be uh, you know, large corporations and those industry groups that are well connected. You're, you're referring. You're, you're, you're referring in part to the you know the what 13 or so publicly traded companies that accessed um, that money, and you know many of whom are, are now giving it back. It was obviously far from a perfect environment. Oh, sure. Yes, the speed, of course, you have to take into consideration as you just referenced, uh, but companies yeah. like that, yeah. like the ones that were taking money, are the ones you're speaking about. Well, I'm not uh, some of them. Of. I mean, that's a that's a that's a subset of what I'm talking. About. I'm really talking about the massive bailouts, and I, I know they're now talking about the oil and gas industry is a is another type of bailout. But the airline industry is kind of the poster child. Uh, it really is. Uh, I think people should be frustrated that these airlines spent a huge fraction of their free cash flow on buybacks in recent years, and now are being bailed out to a degree of cash that's higher than the amount of bought back. The, you know, the dollar amount bought back. It's, it's like the government, uh, you have these companies that leverage themselves up to the hilt and were not very well managed, therefore, just push, push, push to get the stock price up and to get the earnings uh, financially engineered. And now we're essentially buying back, in a sense, I mean, I know this isn't literally the case, but in a sense, we, they, they bought back $45.5 billion of stock. Right. And now we're buying it back at a profit, in essence, at a higher value. Yeah, you are. You are certainly. You have company. You have a lot of company in that. In that criticism, you could bring up Carnival Cruise Line, for example, as well. Your, your point there, Jeffrey, is well taken. And and like I said, you are not the only person who is raising the issue of of bailouts, what they mean to to the fundamentals of how capitalism operates. For example, I you know I'm not sure if you had followed the the conversation that I'd had over the last couple of weeks with Chamath Palihapitiya, who raised similar did, concerns yeah. uh, about did, buybacks. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Right, it, I, I did listen to that conversation. I thought it was really fascinating and really, really food for thought and, and debate. 
Um, I, I also think it's not just bailouts, though. It's not just buybacks. I mean, certainly there shouldn't be buybacks for companies that are repeatedly needing assistance. That's ridiculous. But beyond that, um, what about the way people live their personal lives with cash-out refinancing of their houses, you know, just borrowing money all the time to go on, you know, pretty lavish and extravagant vacations and buying, you know, really expensive phones and all this stuff. I, I, I think we should limit, we should really think as a society about limiting this debt-based uh, motivation. Uh, you know, I, a friend of mine actually unbelievably had a child, and the child, when they were six months old, received a credit card application in the mail. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it's really, I mean, when, I was, when I was a teenager, when I first was coming of age, I, I remember getting my first credit card. And I needed to apply for it. I, I sort of couldn't believe they accepted me. And actually, you had this weird feeling of pride, like, hey, I've got a credit card. Like, I'm deserving. I, I, I you know, I qualify. I've, I've sort of made it in, in society. But, but this has gone wild where everything's just based upon borrowing money, cash out refinancing, I mean, car loans that are, are, are many, many years in term. I mean, I, I think we should think seriously about demotivating people to just constantly borrow and uh, be in a position where when the, when the downturn happens, and it always eventually happens, they're forced in a situation where they're destitute, basically. I think, you, that, I think that could be one of the, the, the things that maybe develops on the other side of this, is you have a fundamentally, fundamentally different way yeah. that maybe people think about yeah. their lives. Absolutely. But that, all, that yeah. also has a ramification, doesn't it, on, on the economy on, on the other side it, it, and growth? It's it's very positive for the long term. Unfortunately, you know when you, when you finally have to take the medicine of getting off of a, a, of a lifestyle that you basically can't afford, you have to shift down to a lower level. And that's why I think that's why I think we're looking at a lower uh, lower low in the stock market because these things are gonna these things are going to make themselves known uh, with with a lag. Like what about state colleges and universities? I've been mean, reading articles about what if they don't reopen. You know, I mean, I know that that might be a pessimistic case, of course, but if they don't reopen these state college universities, they're not going to they're not going to be able to survive. We're talking about colleges, universities, uh, potentially going basically closing down because of financial reasons. And I don't think people understand the state and local government consequences of what's happening here. Uh, I was listening to the radio, and Mayor Garcetti last week said that the city of Los Angeles is in the worst financial condition of, of, in its history. Yet three months ago, the financial condition of Los Angeles was pretty good, at least over the short term. So these, these, uh, this unemployment and the tax hit and then the tax holidays – and the uh, you know, don't pay your rent, the way that filters through the system. So still, there's a lot of really serious structural damage that's been mm -hmm. done. And I think those of us that follow, you know, the stock market averages day by day and see that the corporate bond market has recovered thanks to the Fed, I don't think that they really understand what it's like uh, out there in the real world. Let me... Where, uh, Go ahead. I understand. I, I'm, I'm sorry. It's, it's just our time always goes too fast, and we, and we don't have that much right. left. I, I want to get you um, to comment more uh, on, on what the Fed uh, has done. I know you, you, know, you tweeted specifically about um, the buying of the high-yield e ETF. I was reading an interesting article in the Journal today, and maybe you saw it as well, on these extraordinary and unprecedented measures that the Fed has taken, uh, Jeffrey. And there was a quote in there from, from Janet Yellen that I wanted you to react to, if you would, she said, this is why, of, of all of these extraordinary measures and the things that the Fed has, has done it, and still, frankly, may do, this is why the Federal Reserve was invented, she said, to do emergency lending in a crisis. You know, and others have made the comment, too, that maybe they didn't, no one wanted to be in this position, but we are in this position, and thus we need, you know, desperate times call for desperate measures. And this, Janet Yellen says, is what the Fed's here for. What's your reaction to that? Well, I think the Fed is not created to just be a, a fireman, you know, when, when there's a fire. I, I think the Fed is supposed to uh, put, put fire prevention measures in. I mean, the Fed is not supposed to just wait for, you know, gun, gun interest rates down at zero for long periods of time to, to not put up reserve requirements after, say, 1996, that is irrational exuberance. I mean, there used to be conservatism at the Fed where they'd say the, the job of the Fed is to take away the punch bowl when the party's really getting rolling. Well, we didn't do that at all. I mean, we had a 129-month expansion 
which is the longest in U.S. history, which in and of itself tells you that something unnatural is going on. And the country's been around for over 200 years, and we've never had an expansion ever that looked like the one of, of the, the, since the global financial crisis, and now it's been completely erased. So, yeah, I mean, now that, you're, now that you've put yourself in this position, said, yeah, I guess you have to do reactive things, because if they hadn't done anything in March, I mean, you just would have had a total collapse. I mean, the bond market in March, in the high-yield market, even investment-grade corporate market, in the, in the CMBS market, there was no bid. I mean, you simply couldn't. It was much worse than 2008 or early 2009, much worse. And that's why it's comical that I think about how we spoke uh, a, month, a little over a month ago that you know people were talking about how the market was looking a little shaky. Well, they didn't, they didn't have any idea what was coming. There was mm-hmm. literally no bid. So the Fed had had to do something uh, in reaction to that, and they certainly they certainly came in strong. But it's unfortunate that they what, what people like Janet Yellen don't seem to want to take responsibility for is they're also part of why we got towards this problem with the very low interest rates. And, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the Treasury Department's to blame, too, because as I've been talking about my webcast over and over again, there, is, there was no economic growth in 2019. It was all debt. The national debt grew more than nominal GDP. And what other thing a lot of people don't, don't uh, understand is that the 2019 economic growth was basically all consumption. It was all consumer debt. Ninety percent of the GDP in 2019 was consumption. You know, usually consumption is around 70 percent of GDP. But in the 2019, it was the only, basically the only game in town was consumption. Well, what happens now if we go back to 70 percent of GDP as consumption? In other words, that consumption drops. So that it, it goes back to what would have represented more. Sure, but we were we were in an environment, as you say, right? We had you know manufacturing was dislocated because of the, the trade war. We were overly reliant on the consumer and consumption, and now you've basically um, you know locked the the, con, the consumption uh, metric in, in, into a room. I've got three minutes left, Jeffrey. And one of the last times we, we spoke, you had said several weeks ago that you had closed out the last of your S and P shorts. Um, that's right. But you, yeah, you, have, was for do you, do you have more on now because you think we're going to take out the lows? Actually, I did uh, just put a short on the S&P at 2863. So um, at this level, I think the upside downside is very poor because I see, I see really, really tough sledding to try to get the S&P above. Let's just pick a round number, 3,000. Uh, I don't, I don't think it's going to make it to 3,000, but it, it could. You know, 2980 looks like a really tough level to me. And so I think that this is a bad, bad trade location. I think we have downside easily to the lows or beyond, and the upside looks like it's about 3 or 4%. I'm not, I'm not nearly where I was in February, where I was very, very short. But, but um, I, do, I have started to build a partial short position around these levels. Mm-hmm. Well, so what, is, what then is your best trade, would you say, what is the best trade for our viewers who are listening to you and follow you uh, intently? What is the best thing to do in the market today? Is, is short the S&P the, the best idea you have? Or is there something on the credit well, side, or is it something else, commodity-related? Well, I, commodities, no. I, I think right now investors are supposed to be in high liquidity. I'm, I'm basically 50% cash uh, at this present time, you know, down from 100% cash where I was in, in the middle of in the middle of March because of my position is actually on the short side. But I, I don't really like much of anything right here because the markets have all adjusted higher, and I think that there's more trouble coming. Commodities, the problem with commodities, we saw the negative oil price, and that's because commodities is a totally screwed up market because there's all these speculators that don't have the ability to deliver and they certainly don't have the ability to take delivery. We saw that with the oil thing last week. I mean, these people are just speculating, and they have absolutely no ability. They don't even know how to take delivery. And this, I think, is, is happening in, in the more speculative commodity markets. But I think one of the things I talked about on our webcast, it's up on ePlay at DoubleOn.com, A Tale of Two Sinks. I talked about how it bothers me how much speculation there seems to be in, in paper gold. But a lot of people... Are, have made money on gold, and gold's been a very good trade for the past couple of years. But um, what if what if the people who are speculating on the long side of gold actually decide one day to take delivery? I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what would happen. Because I'm not sure there is enough physical gold to deliver into the paper law. 
And so I, I just think the commodity markets need to be seriously reconsidered and maybe regulated more in terms of who's allowed to be long and short these contracts. So I, I, commodities to me just looks like a dangerous market on the speculation side. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey, the time went too fast. It always does. Let's, uh, let's revisit this conversation uh, in the weeks ahead. I do appreciate your time very much today. You be well. Okay. You too, you too Judge. Thanks a lot. Right. Bye. Thanks. That's Jeffrey Gundlach. He's the Double Line CEO.